Well, Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for this awesome time that we are having with you. Lord, I just thank you for this immense pleasure to behold the beauty of your bride. That's us. <laughs> That's us. We are the bride. Yeah. Yeah, it sounded more exciting in my head, but I am a bride. Ah, it comes out still a little bit. You guys get the picture, though. Okay. <laughs> we are the body. That's better. I am the body. I like that. You know, Jesse the body. Anyway, there was a time, i tell you a story. When, when I first got called into full-time ministry, I was... Probably, no, I wouldn't say that. I didn't like the church that much. Would that be an accurate statement? I didn't like the church that much? And then when I got more into ministry, I liked the church even less. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, it's true. And then I started doing evangelism, and then it got even worse. And I was like, Rrr. you know, you, but actually, it's not that uncommon for evangelists not to like the church. Because they do all this work getting people into the kingdom, and they get to the church, and then they get screwed up. <laughs> then they end up back out there, and they've got to, and, and instead of like, instead of like the, the, the seed of the word being planted in somebody's heart, and this person growing into the mature person of Christ that they're supposed to be, it's like, psh, I just inoculated you. Wow. You know, we just get enough, get enough of the word and enough of Jesus to make them say, I'm staying away from that forever. You know, I'm not saying that people get born, you know, I'm not saying that they don't get, actually get born again, but when they come into the church, sometimes there's like this, ah, yeah. it's not a good handoff with the baton. <laughs> and so I'm down, in, I'm down in Tijuana, and I'm just doing some street evangelism, and it was super duper bad, super bad, the, the places that we were at, and just the, you see the, how people treat each other, and just not, the, you know, just the things that you don't want to see is like where I was, and um, I was just so grieved, and I was like, Lord, you know, and, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm praying about a lot of different things, and, and I'm just excited about Jesus, you know what I mean? I'm just super excited about Jesus, and I, I want to, I'm trying to say, Jesus, I love you, and, it, and I'm saying this out loud. I'm like, Jesus, I love your church. I was like, ah. let me try that one more time. Jesus, I love your church. Oh, I'll just say this one more time. Jesus, I love your church. And then I'm like, God, why are you making me say this? I don't even like your church. Okay? And as soon as I said that, it's like, that's the wrong thing to say when you're having a conversation with the Lord. As soon as I said that, it was like, oh, I felt like this big, like, you know, you know what I'm talking about? It's this big, ooh, like bad, like I'm backing up really fast inside. My spirit's just going, shh, like, and the Lord says, and it was just like light, just light just came down. He said, you love my church. Because <laughs> I was believing a lie, okay? He said, you love my church because you can't love the head and not love the body. Wow. That's good. I know. Yeah. And I said, wow, I love your church. <laughs> that's how real it is for Jesus. Like, he's the head, we're the body. Like, we're one, okay? We're one. Yes. We're one. Like, he's, he's not playing around. He's, like, we are one with him. And he loves us like he loves his own body, you know? Because uh, uh, we are his own body, you know? In a, in a corporate sense and in an actual physical sense, like, it's him, you know? He's in us. It's he, it's he, it's he in us. And, all right, I'm going to get some scriptures in here. These scriptures are going to, they're going to be really good because they're all really good. Amen. Amen. What is it, Second, uh, 1 Timothy 3.16? No, 2 Timothy 3.16. Word of God is profitable for correction, for reproof, for doctrine. Yes. It's all that stuff. It's, we're, 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 we, we love the word. Amen. Praise the Lord. Whew, man. I am super excited to be up here today. Come on. Oh, even more than usual. What is, praise the Lord. Oh, okay. <clears throat> 
when you have some thin spots on your lawn, you know, maybe the dirt is shown through, it's a little dirty in places, like we have going on right now, one of the things you do is you aerate the lawn and you overseed. That's what the Lord told me he was doing here this morning. Wow. He was aerating and overseeding. The spirit was aerating and the words overseeding, okay? Oh. <laughs> and there's going to be some, some of the spots that you've been a little thin, boom, get ready, okay? <laughs> Just get ready. There's going to be harvest time, okay? I'm telling you. Aerate, aeration and overseeding to the point where you're going to want to watch the replay because you're going to get to a point where you might not hear the next 5 or 10 or 15 minutes of the service because something clicked in your head. And in the process of that clicking, there's going to be some uprooting happening. Some lies are going to get pulled out by the roots all the way down, pulled out by the roots, and going to get replaced by the truth. Okay? So, do you know, heaven is always on. It never shuts off. (laughs) It's always on. The, the heaven is always on. Come on. 24 7, seven days a week, heaven is on. The, the anointing of heaven in you can always be flowing. Amen. It always flowed in Jesus because he knew who he was. Oof. Praise the Lord. Okay. Uh, you know, the Lord said, He's going to reset our comfort zones this morning. Comfort zone just kept coming up, coming up, coming up. Because I'm resetting comfort zones. I'm resetting comfort zones. You know, and we all have comfort zones. We have an upper limit, which we won't go out of, and we have a lower limit, which we won't go out of. The upper limit is usually set because we're, um, we're afraid to do more than a certain thing because it's called fear of failure, okay? Remember, there's no fear in love. Perfect love gets rid of that. So we're afraid that we're going to fail if we go too high. And then we have this lower limit down here, which is the fear of re- usually set by the fear of rejection. Well, if I don't conform in a certain way, people aren't going to want to be a part or be around me. So we have a lower limit and we have an upper limit. It's called our comfort zone. The Lord said this morning he's adjusting our comfort zones yeah. as high as we will let him. <laughs> and when we adjust our comfort zones, we come up with them. All right? It's like a... <laughs> oh, praise the Lord. <clears throat> so Peter, okay, here's an example. Peter's comfort zone was in the boat. Jesus' comfort zone was on the water. All right? Peter saw something outside of his comfort zone, and he stepped into it and said, I want to try this. Well, then he kind of stepped back into his comfort zone because he said, then all of a sudden his comfort zone was, oh, I would rather be in the boat because he's, ah, oh, you know, and he starts to go back down. Jesus helps him back up, and they get back in the boat. Okay, you can't consistently perform at a level that you are that you don't believe you should be. Okay, so sometimes when we're when we're continually trying something or continually trying to move forward, but we continue to fail, it's because there's something inside of us that doesn't agree with that. So our 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 comfort zone, our homeostasis kicks in, and we want to go back to that safe place. For Peter, the safe place was the boat, even though it's a huge storm and they're about to. <laughs> Think about it. Ah, I can walk on the waves or I can get in the boat where the storm is going to bounce me all over the place. Sometimes our comfort zones really aren't that comfortable. It's just that what we're, what we're used to. You know, some people, their comfort zone involves them carrying huge amounts of debt. Huge amounts of debt. Huge amounts of, you know, maybe, maybe your comfort zone is that your credit card has a $12,000 balance, but you pay it off every month. Praise the Lord. You know, or you make the minimum payment every month. But your comfort zone is... That one thing, in your, that's, you've adjusted your comfort zone to accept that. Well, the reality was, if, if you change your thinking, you change your comfort zones. And then all of a sudden, you're not comfortable with that anymore, and it's going to go. Okay? There's, there's chains have been broken here today, like really broken. When you go back out to your car, don't put them back on. Okay? I was really comfortable with this thing. I had boundaries. Now... Now I actually believe I can do all things through Christ, and it's a little scary. Well, praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. We got, we're, God is, he broke the chains on your comfort zone. You don't have to stay in that place anymore. Aeration and overseeding is happening to you, okay? Overseeding. The word of God is what's going to bring that, bring that to reality in you. When you keep, you just keep planting that word. You keep planting that word. You keep planting that word, and it's going to, it's going to, the, the aeration of the spirit is going to take that word and it's going to bring that. Mm. 
I'm not making this stuff up. This is real. This is real. All right. Okay, so what was Jesus' comfort zone? His comfort zone said, I and the Father are one. His comfort zone said, it's the fa- when I speak the word, when I speak the word, I am the word. I am the living word. When I speak the word, I speak the word of God, the, the word of the Father, because we are one. The Father, he does the work. I speak the word. Wow. His comfort zone said, and this has been accomplished in your hearing, what, Isaiah 61. That's his comfort zone. That's how he operated. That's how he operated. He operated in this comfort zone. And the disciples looked at him, and they were like, hmm, this is uncomfortable. (laughs) But it wasn't for Jesus because he he knew his identity. I and the Father are one. He was rooted and grounded in this this love, all right? Because when you understand, understanding is, 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 is a, when you begin to understand this, the love that the, the love that God has for you, the love that the Father has for you, that you should be called the sons and daughters of God, wow, it adjusts your comfort zone. If you let it, though, if you let it, if you let it. So when, 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 I, get to, when I understand, like, wow, the Father and I are one because I'm in Christ and Christ is in me and Christ is in the Father and the Father is in me. I am one with the Father. Wow, God is love. I'm one with love. What place does fear have in me at this point? It has the place that I'll let it have in me, but no more than that. It's up to me because I've been given all authority and power. Okay, I have, Amen. oh man, yes. I have the authority and power to, to renew my mind, Romans 12, 1 and 2. Okay, why? Because it's the reasonable thing to do at this point. <laughs> Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Why? Because it's your reasonable act of service. It's the only reasonable thing. You're, you're, and then Romans 12, 2 says, no longer be conformed to that image that set your comfort zone. No longer be conformed to the world, that image that the world put on you and said, this is who you are, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind to God's word, to the image of Christ in you, so that you get to prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Wow. Isn't that awesome? So I'm, as, I, as, I, as I reset my image based on the unconditional love that God has for me, I have, to, I, have to, I have to think about what the limitations are in my life, and I have to analyze them in the, in the, in the exact radiance that Jesus presents, Hebrews 1.3, the exact radiance of God that he presents in me, and say, Does, is this a valid fear anymore at this point? Oh, probably not. Okay. Well, then why am I letting it hold me back anymore? You know, and the, the fear of rejection and the fear of failure are the two biggest fears that hold most humans back in, in anything in life. And it's the same thing true for the church. And for a, a born-again new creation believer, once you come into the kingdom, you are a new creation in Christ. The fear of failure. You can do all things in Christ who strengthens you. You can do all things in Christ. Amen. And if you screw up, go boldly go before the throne of grace in your time of need. Yes. And God's there for you. Yes. The fear of rejection. What, at this point, what can separate you from the love of God? Nothing. <laughs> Why am I afraid anymore? Where did Jesus demonstrate fear? I'm scared. No, he didn't. He didn't. Psalms 27.10 says, mm, it's one of my favorite scriptures. Yes. If your father and mother forsake you, the Lord, mm, Jesus. The Lord will take you. Okay? The Lord literally is your father. Okay? This is a reality. This is a reality for you. If your father, you know, and, it, and, it, and it, you know, we talk about this in the context of your father and mother forsake you. You know, David wrote this, and uh, it seemed like his father and mother forsook him. <laughs> oh, him? He, uh, the little one? Yeah, we don't even count him. You want, why would you want to see him, Prophet Samuel? 
Yeah, I mean, think about this. This is, this is David's reality. He's been forsaken by his father and mother. You know, and, and, that, and, and for, for those of us who've lost a, a parent or both parents, you know, not, not that your parents forsook you, but they're, they're gone. The, the Lord is literally your father. But as you can see in the case of David, you don't have to wait for your natural parents to die <laughs> to, to walk into that reality, to, to walk, to step into that reality like, no, my God is my father. Amen. I and the father are one. His spirit resides in me through, through Jesus Christ, his son. And when his word comes out of my mouth, it's his word. <laughs> Amen. It's his word, and he's going to do the work. Yeah. And as I, as I renew my mind to the image that God has for me through his word, it transforms my thinking. Yeah. I cannot consistently behave in a manner which I do not believe. The things that happen to me, the, th the situations I'm in, the person I am today is a result of what I have thought to this point. The amazing news is the amount of transformation we can experience in this world is unlimited through Jesus Christ. <laughs> Amen. The amazing thing is that his word is going to renew our minds. And we are unlimited in participating in the divine nature according to the word of God. Unlimited. You have unlimited potential. Unlimited potential. Unlimited. Jesus said, John 14, 12, greater works than me. His, his, when he sees you, he says, wow, you have unlimited potential. What do you see when you see you? James chapter 1 says, if you don't look at, this, at the word of God and see yourself in it, you're like a man who's forgotten what you look like. Wow. Whoa. That's how I got to see me. Man. Lord, that's good. Okay, I'm going to get to the message. Praise <laughs> the Lord. Where is the message? In the word, praise the Lord. Oh, here we go, Romans 4, 4, Romans 4, NIV. I'm reading this out of 6 feet. Therefore, the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace and, and may be guaranteed to all of Abraham's offspring. That's you and me. Not only those who are of the law, but also those who have the faith of Abraham. Again, raise your hand if that's you. That's me. That's you. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God. Woo, thank you, Jesus. In whom he believed. The God who gives life to the dead and calls things into being that are not. Wow. wow. He calls things into being that are not. Romans 8, 29 and 31. For God foreknew he also predestined he to be conformed to the image of his son. That's you. You're predestined to become the, to conformed to the image of Christ. That he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And I have to say, Jesus has a nice looking family. All right? I'm just telling you that. Amen. And those he predestined, he also called and justified and glorified. Oh, that's you, called, justified, and glorified. What shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Wow. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. Romans 4.16, the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace. The promise comes by faith. The promises of God's word come when we believe them because they're all available through grace. And if that wasn't the truth, it wouldn't be grace. Everything in God's kingdom. That's, you know, when Gary was talking about, you know, God said, you've robbed me. Do you think God's gotten like, man, I should have $2.74 more cents in my account? No. He's, you, God is saying, you robbed me of my ability to pour out my blessing on you. Because all this stuff is for you, not for me. That's, God didn't make this stuff for himself. He made it for us. Yep. He made us for him. Yeah. <laughs> We're the ones that are for him. And when, he, you know, and, when, and when we don't step into that faith and believe, he can't bless us according to that. Right. I'm going to go into Samuel. 
Praise the Lord. You know what? I have iPads up here. I have notebooks. I have staples. I even have diagrams. I hope you guys are comfortable in your chairs. We might be here for a while. Come on. Overseed. We're overseeding. Yes. Let her rip. All right. Samuel, if you have uh, the opportunity to turn in your Bibles, I don't know if these are, I don't think these are in the notes. Um, <laughs> actually, no, I, first we're going to, first we're going to go to Job. Right, you got to kill Job chapter, uh, chapter three, verse 25. This is Jesus. People always say, well, what about Job? Not always, since I have heard that, well, what about Job? Remember, in the last chapter of Job, Job repents for not knowing anything he was talking about. He says, I've got this all wrong. But there's one thing that Job said that I believe was really right. And uh, John chap- or Job chapter 3, verse 25, he says, What I have always feared has happened to me. What I have, what I have dreaded has come true. I have no peace, no quiet, no rest, and only trouble comes. What did Job fear? He, he, he feared trouble. What did he anticipate? No peace, no, we- no rest, it, 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 just trouble. That's all he thought about. Whatever you set your heart to and you, and you put your desire, desire is like not just, oh, I want that, but desire is like, I want that. And you, it's like you attach this, your spiritual energy to it, okay? Especially as a new creation. The, you're going you're gonna to bring that manifestation into reality, according to God's word. Fear works the same way. You attach your spiritual entity, you know, you, 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 it, it, as, as a creative being now, you're a new creation in Christ, as a creative being, yeah. when you speak out the negative things and you, have a, you have, and you have a belief on that stuff, especially when you believe it, you know, you're, you're speaking it out, you're going to bring that manifestation into the course. And we see this in the, in the life of Job. He got what he thought about. Got, Job got what he feared. Job was well-developed in fear. We get to be well-developed in faith. And when we say, well, what about Job? We can look at Job and say, ah, oh, that's not what to do. Amen. <laughs> that's not, because Job had a, Job had this attitude that, well, God was in charge. He's a good God. He's a good God. Right? Yeah. Job's wife, have you cursed God yet? Oh, no, I'll never curse God. I don't know why he's doing all this stuff to me, but I'll never curse him. That's the wrong attitude. Job's mouth was doing it to him. Job's beliefs were doing it to him. In the last chapter, Job repents. He says, now what I heard wasn't true, but now that I see you clearly, Lord, I repent because I've been wrong. Okay? Job was well-developed in fear. That is not for us. Amen? We don't, we don't, we don't look at those scriptures and say, ooh, how can I, how can I fit that paradigm? <laughs> We say, ooh, how do, I, how do I avoid the same mistakes Job yes. made? Yes. Stop worrying, yes. right? Yes. Don't stop, cast your cares upon him because yes. he cares for you. Matthew 9, 29, um, Jesus said to the blind people, he said, may it be according to your faith, all right? This is a principle that we have to learn, and we're learning it and we're growing in it. Again, it has to be by faith so that it can be by grace, in Mark 11, 24, Jesus says, whatsoever you desire, when you pray, believe that you received it, and you'll have it. Now, in Samuel chapter 10, <laughs> in Samuel chapter 10, we see David is being, I'm not sorry, I'm sorry, not David, but um, Saul. This is, this, okay, I'm just going to read this. Uh, so Samuel took off the flask of oil. Samuel chapter 10, verse 1. If you can find it, that would be awesome. Um, Samuel took out the flask of oil and poured it on Saul's head and kissed him, saying, Has not the Lord anointed you ruler over his inheritance? Wow. The Lord has anointed Saul ruler over his, his inheritance. Saul is being anointed king by Samuel. When you leave me today, you will meet two men near Rachel's tomb, and it's going to be there. They will say to you, the donkeys you set out to look for have been found. And now your father is, now your father is thinking about, is, has, is thinking about them, is now worried about you. He is asking, what shall I do about my son? 
Then you will go on from there, and you will reach a great tree of Tabor. Three men will going forth to worship God will meet you there. One will be carrying uh, some instruments, another will be doing this, and then they, they will greet you, they will offer you two loaves of bread, you will accept them. After that, you will go here, and this is going to happen. And as you approach the town, you will meet a procession of prophets. When they get there, they're going to be playing instruments. You are going to start prophesying. The Spirit of the Lord will come powerfully upon you. And listen to this. And you will prophesy with them, and you will be changed into a different person. Once these signs are fulfilled, do whatever your hand finds to do, for God is with you. What an awesome, that is so awesome. Yeah. That's almost as good as we have it now. Yeah. Not quite. Almost. The anointing is on him. Yeah. And he's got these, these signs are going to happen, and there's going to be confirmation. And he's anointed, and the prophet Samuel, who's the big boss prophet, said, do whatever your hand finds to do because the Lord is with you. You are unstoppable. You have been put in charge of the Lord's inheritance. You are king. You are anointed. So what happens? Well, as we read on, um, he, he, goes, he goes out. Saul goes out. All these things happen to him. In verse 9, Samuel chapter 10, verse 9, it says that, So Saul turned to leave Samuel. God changed Saul's heart, and all these things were fulfilled that day. Yep. Wow. God changed Saul's heart. There was a supernatural thing that happened to Saul. <laughs> the Spirit of the Lord is on Saul. Saul is anointed. Saul is commissioned. Saul has basically been told, you are unstoppable. And then God does an internal work on Saul, changes his heart. That's what the scripture says, changes his heart. In verse 22, we find Saul hiding. They ask the Lord where Saul is, and he says, Behold, he has hidden himself among the baggage. He is hiding God anointed him. God declared the word over him. God changed his heart. Saul didn't change his thinking. He did not renew his mind accordingly. He did not renew his mind according to the word of God. Therefore, Saul goes back in and he acts exactly the way he did before the anointing came upon him. He acts exactly the way he did before the change of heart happened. He acts exactly the way he did before the word of the Lord came to him. He goes and he hides. He's hiding. He's hiding. <laughs> Why is he hiding? Didn't the, does, he, does he not believe God? Well, the easy answer is, well, of course he doesn't believe God, otherwise he wouldn't. I would bet if Saul was here, or if I was there, if we were together, and I said, Saul, do you believe God? He'd say, yes, I believe God with all my heart. I believe God with all my heart. And what, then why are you hiding? Because it's me. Because I'm a nobody, okay? And you read in this verse, it says Saul's a head taller than everybody else. He stands up and he's the biggest guy in the room. He's not a runt. He's the biggest dude there. He's tall. He's got it all. He's got the anointing. He's got the attributes. He's got everything he needs. One thing he lacks The renewed mind. Wow. He, lacks the, he lacks the same image that God has of him. God told him through his prophet, I have changed your heart. I have put you in charge of my inheritance, and I have commissioned you. You go and do it, and I'm going to back you up. Yep. What is Saul? Saul does not see any of that. I, so Saul is in this spot. He's hiding. Now we go into Samuel 13. Um, when, when Saul is waiting for Samuel in, in just a few, three chapters later, some time has passed, um, Saul's waiting for Samuel, and he doesn't show up in time. Saul goes ahead and he makes these sacrifices. Again, I'll tell you what I, I believe. I believe, okay, so the, people are, the people are fearful, the people are scared. Saul is concerned about rejection right here. He's, he's, he's reaching his lower limit of his comfort zone. I need to do something. 
to stay in my comfort zone because people are abandoning me, people are rejecting me. I need to do something to get the favor of the Lord because as he said, I, I didn't seek the favor of the Lord. He already had the favor of the Lord. Right. He already had it. You can't get any more favor than that. You can't, I mean, that's the truth. And so he goes and he does something against God's commands. Samuel shows up and says, oh, Saul, because you have done this, the kingdom is going to be taken from you and given to another. If you would have listened, your kingdom would have been established forever. David was choice number two. You gotta, if we read these scriptures, you will see this is the truth. Like Saul was God's plan A. Okay? Saul was the first choice. Saul could not renew his mind. Or he could have, but he didn't. He stuck with the same image that he had before. So he's stuck, in this, he's stuck in this place where he's seeing himself. He's not seeing himself in union with God. He's not seeing himself in the covenant. I, if you asked him, Did you, do you believe in the covenant that God has with Abraham? I'm sure he'd have been like, yes, I believe in it. Do you believe it's for you? Do you, it's one thing to believe in a covenant. It's another thing to believe that you are in it. It's one thing to believe in Jesus. Another thing to believe that he's in you and you are in him. Like you are in this. You're in it all the way. People say, I've heard, I've heard from time to time I hear somebody say, oh, I'm nothing without Jesus. Like that statement, it makes zero sense. That's like saying yeah. water is n nothing without oxygen. Water doesn't exist without oxygen. H2O, okay, hydrogen and oxygen come together. Well, water's not nearly as wet without oxygen. Water doesn't exist. You don't exist without Jesus. Yes. Your, your, your being is not in existence outside of Christ anymore. Right. You were at one time, but now that old, the old you is crucified with Christ. The new yes. creation you yes. is in Christ to the reality that you cannot exist outside of him. So therefore, from this day forth, you can no longer say, I am nothing without Jesus why? Because you are separating yourself in your mind from Christ when you say that statement. Yeah. Well, that's not really what I mean. Then stop saying it. Just stop. Don't say that. You do not exist outside of Christ. You, 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 there is no, there, for you, there is no reality outside of him. Except for the reality you have in your mind. The separation in your mind at this point. Saul was anointed. He was in covenant. He was part of the covenant. He was anointed, he was commissioned, he had the skills, he had the attributes, and he saw himself outside of it. I am nothing without the Lord. I am nothing. But you're not. You got it all. Yep. So then we come forward and we, and we get into um, Psalms 17, <laughs> and there's David, this little David, okay? I believe David got anointed by Samuel in Psalm 16, He's now anointed king, but Saul is still the king. They have the same anointing. They both have the king anointing on him. Right. <laughs> David shows up, and Goliath is there. All, it says when the troop, when Goliath would come out, it said the, the soldiers would shake in their tents. They would all run and hide in their tents. Where did they learn that approach from? From Saul. Yeah. He's in his tent. We see that as we read the chapter. David gets sent to Saul's tent where he's shaking. All the troops are following his lead. Now Saul, who has the same anointing as David, except he's probably super big because he's a foot taller than everybody else, and David is just a boy. David steps up, and he first he asks, he's like, what's going to happen to the guy that does this? And his bro David's brother is like, what is wrong with you? Why are you coming here? Why are you saying this stuff? You're just, a, you know, you're, just, you're just blabbing again, blabbing. And David's like, oh, what did I do this time? Okay? Yeah. If you read the chapters, David's like, well, what did I do now? That's the response of someone who constantly gets criticized. Wow. But does not receive it. Because he keeps going. He keeps going. And he says, hey, did I get this right? Are you, are you telling me this is what's going to happen? He asked three times. And then and the reason why he's asking that, because he wants to know what he's going to get. And the truth is, if he didn't think that was a good deal for him, he wouldn't have stepped in to receive it. David thinks he's worth it. 
Why? Because he sees himself inside his covenant. He knows he's the seed of Abraham. He knows he's anointed. He's, he got this. He's, he's like, this is part of the deal, isn't it? That's, what we, that's how we need to renew our minds. Yeah. Yeah. We're like, oh, this is part of the deal, isn't it? Health? Ah, wholeness? Yeah. Prosperity? Witty inventions? Freedom? This is part of the deal. Yeah. This is for me. Yes. Vict- victory? Yeah. Do you know victory is outside of a, uh, this may be a surprise for, this this took me by surprise. Victory is outside of a lot of people's comfort zones. Not just the church, but the the, the victory. Why? Because they're more comfortable. We talked about this before. They're more comfortable in the battle than they are in the victory. Because they've been conditioned to stay in the fight when God has called us to be victorious. Because the battle is already won in him. But we've conditioned ourselves to stay in a fight that we don't need to stay in, and we are weary and we're tired, but we're comfortable. Wow. We gotta be done with this. So Saul is comfortable hiding in his tent and shaking and leading all his army in shaking in fear. David is comfortable in finding out what his benefit package is when he does what he's about to do. And then Saul, Saul's like, oh, he looks at him, he's like, you're not gonna do this very well, are you? Again, he's getting, David's getting rejected. We saw in, in Samuel chapter 16, David is rejected by his father. Yep. His, his, his brothers are rejecting him. And the king is like, uh, you're just a boy. But we, but in, we see David, when he sees, this, when he sees Goliath, he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? David is recognizing the covenant He's recognizing the blessing. But more than that, he sees himself in it. He sees himself in it. This, this is for me. Yes. In Christ, we have been blessed with every heavenly blessing. Do you see yourself in the blessing? Wow. Do you see yourself in the new covenant? Yes. Do you see yourself in Christ? Because it's all for you. But if you don't see yourself in it, You're not going to be in it, even though you already are in it. Saul was already anointed. God had told him, do what you need to do to get the job done, and I'm going to back you up. I have put you in charge of my inheritance. Now who's in charge of his inheritance? That's us. (laughs) Where are we right now in the battle? Are we in the tent, shaking in fear, praying for some little guy named David to show up and help us? (laughs) Someone who's not as skilled, not as qualified, but believes in the anointing that we have already. So David shows up, and he's oozing with self-confidence. Well, wasn't that a little bit presumptuous? Well, he was was presuming the Lord was going to keep his word. (laughs) He was presuming that the Lord was going to keep his covenant. That's what he was presuming. So, yes, it was presumptuous. He presumed the Lord was a truth teller. He presumed that the word of God was powerful. He presumed that the covenant he was in mattered, and he saw himself in that covenant. So then he goes into this, he goes into this battle, and he knows, he, he, David knows it's not even fair. Do you know it's not even fair? It's not even fair. This covenant that we're in, we, it's not even fair. Like, we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. That means every blessing that's in heaven has already been released to us. Out of the good treasure, a man speaks and brings forth what has already been stored up in him. Man, every spiritual blessing that you have is already in your spirit. When we take the word of God and we plant that seed in there, it's in our mind, it's in our soul. It renews our thinking to line up with what has already been planted by God. He wrote his word in our heart. It's already been there. It's already there. And that connection happens. We, We plug in. We plug it in, okay? Heaven never shuts off. Heaven is always on. But are we connected to it? Are we plugged into it? Jesus was always plugged in. That's why somebody could touch him and be like, boom, I just got healed. And Jesus like, what just happened? I felt the anointing. Because he, he was always connected. Because he never doubted his identity. He was always connected. He was always flowing. Right. He was never like, ooh, wait a minute, wait a minute. When he said, I only do what the Father's doing. 
He didn't mean he, and I literally used to think this, so I used to think that Jesus would look up into heaven and see who the Father was healing before he healed anybody. Because Jesus only did what the Father was doing. So if the Father was not healing women with issues of blood that day, Jesus would have had to ask for that healing back. Ooh, that's an unauthorized healing. No. Like, seriously, that's a, uh, I've come a long way. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I've come a long way. Thank you, Jesus. And I had a hard time trying to figure that verse out. I, trying to, I had a hard time trying to fit that verse into my belief system. But I just ended up having to change what I believe to line up with the Bible. So much better. So much better. So much better. The truth was, Jesus was looking at this verse. I mean, or maybe, maybe not this particular verse, but Jesus understood the concept. Do whatever your hand feels to do because I am with you. If it falls within your assignment, which is heal the sick, raise the dead, and cast out devils, Isaiah 61, that anointing is always going to be flowing, yeah. which is our, our assignment, our anointing here. Rebuild the ruined cities. Okay, so now David's in this spot. He, he recognizes his covenant. It's the same covenant that Saul is in. But David steps out, and he defeats a giant. And he says, this day, I will. This day, yes. I will. Yes. He says it. I will cut your head off. I will, I will feed the army to the birds. I will do this because the Lord is with me. Some of us have the reverse thing going on. This day, Lord, I need you to do this, and I need you to do that, and I need you to do this because I'm with you. And the Lord is saying, uh, reverse that. Because yeah. I can't do it unless you, I, I'm going to back you up, but I need you to step it out. I need you to step out in faith. Come on. Okay? I need you to step out in faith and believe. I need you to get beyond your comfort zone. Get beyond your comfort zone. Get beyond the conformity that we've had put upon us by a world system that wants to keep everybody down. Everybody's staying in their place. That is not for us, church. We have been anointed. We have the anointing of Jesus. The same resurrection power that brought him out of that tomb resides in each one of us in this room. Amen. Without limit. Yes. We have been given the spirit of God without limit. We have, a, we have the word of God without limit. We have this, yeah. but it really comes down to what do you see when you look at yourself on the inside? The 10 spies, the 10 leaders saw themselves as grasshoppers. And so that's what they projected. Everybody sees us as grasshoppers. This is who we are because they didn't renew their minds to God's word. Joshua and Caleb, we, what do they say? God is well able. He said, we are well able. Why? Because God's word tells us we are. Right. We are well able. You are well able. Yes. This day, God is blessing you with favor, but he needs you to personalize it. Yes. <laughs> we got to personalize this word. Oh, God loves everybody. He loves you. Do you I mean, and that's really what it comes down to. Yes. Like, do you really, man, when I think about how much God loves me, yes. it's just mind-blowing. It's just unbelievable. Like the love the Father has for us is over, if you let it, it will overwhelm you. It'll, it'll overwhelm your consciousness. It'll overwhelm your subconsciousness. Amen? Yes. And, and I, we got to do some aeration right now, okay? Yeah. It's just, we ready to come on up? And, oh, yeah. 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 We're going we're gonna to do some aeration in the spirit here, okay? Because there's been a lot of word. We, we had a lot of word released. There's a lot of word, a lot of word. And as we, as we we're just going to go into, we got some time, a little bit time here. Mm -hmm. we can, I want you guys to not rush out of here because we're, we're doing this yeah. a little bit earlier than normal. But I want you to receive the word of God. Philippians 4, 13 says, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You can do all things. And it's personalized. It says, I can do it. I can do all things. It means that you can do it. If that verse is true, and it is, it's true for you. As, we, as we're meditating on this word, and the spirit of God is moving in this place, because he's moving in a mighty way. He's really, he really is. He's just moving in a real powerful way. Let the Holy Spirit shed some light into the areas that maybe you've got, you've got the anointing pinned up a little bit. You've got the anointing of God blocking you a little bit. Is there a, 
Is there a stronghold? Because strongholds are really what set the limits on our, on our thinking. And a stronghold is a, it's an automated thought pattern. It's a conditioned response. So when you hear something beyond what your stronghold allows you, you automatically reject it or you automatically receive it. And it's almost involuntary because it's a conditioned response. It's part of who you've been conformed to be. The Lord is tearing down strongholds today. He is tearing down strongholds and he's replacing them with the truth. Because there's some blessings that, the, that have been bottled up by strongholds that have set your comfort zone. And the Lord, he's way beyond that. You, you're all water walkers, amen? You're all dead raisers. You're all healers. You're all blessed. You're all prospered. You're all, if, if you have received Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are all in him and he is all in you. What great love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. His children. David knew, despite whoever rejected him, who his father was. It was God. It wasn't Jesse. It was God. Jesse was his biological father, and I'm sure he loved and respected him. But God was his father. David's the guy who wrote Psalm chapter 8. Oh, what is man that you should think of him? the son of man that you should think about how think about us yet you have made him a little bit lower than yourself God that's what David thought of himself a man after God's own heart because he believed God and he believed the covenant he was in and David understood the authority that he had based on who he was in his covenant now David longed for the days that we are in he prophesied he wrote about us like oh there's going to, a time is coming when the Spirit of God is going to be inside of you. And it's going to be for everybody who believes. That's this time. The Spirit of God is on the inside of us now. We are in this eternal covenant through Jesus. This covenant is not between you and the Father. This covenant is between Jesus, the man, the Son, and the Father. You enter in through Christ. And you enter into the covenant. A covenant that's contained in the Godhead. That's where you are right now. Praise the Lord. So Jesus, we love you. We thank you right now. We thank you for setting us free. We thank you for renewing our minds by your word and by your spirit. We acknowledge the covenant that we are in. We acknowledge that we are new creation, new covenant realities in you. We acknowledge that your anointing is in us and on us. Lord, right now I just ask that your Holy Spirit just bring truth and freedom to our thinking, to, to our minds, restoration and healing to our bodies. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.